Good afternoon. This is Kevin Groves, Assistant Professor of Organization Theory and Management at the Grazia Dio School of Business and Management, and this is the Grazia Dio Business Report. Today is May 12th, 2010, and I'm here with Robert Blackwell, Chairman and CEO of Blackwell Consulting Services. Uh, Bob comes to us today with more than 35 years of industry experience. Uh, he's a well-known leader in the management consulting and inf information technology services industry. And he's coming to us to speak about uh, leadership lessons learned and leadership principles uh, throughout his career. Robert, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us today. You're very welcome. Uh, so let's get to it. Uh, what would you describe as the most important leadership lessons you've learned throughout your career? Well, I think there are, are two lessons. One is, I think you have to know what you're talking about. And number two is, I think there are certain uh, values uh, honesty, integrity, things like that that people will remember most of all and that will detract from your other skills if you don't have them. Mm -hmm. okay. and you think about some of the, the core values that, have, that, have, that stand out during defining moments of, of your career. Could you describe one or two of those defining moments that really stand out to you as a, a important part of your leadership development path? Well, I, I think um, being fair to people and treating people the way you'd want to be treated is really important. And, and um, you know, I, I think back in my own life, I had things that happened to me because I was African American. It caused me to be sensitive to certain kinds of values. And I've been particularly sensitive to the challenges that women have in the marketplace. And you find, um, so often that women are asked to choose, choose between being a first-rate executive and being a mother. And I think that's a silly point of view. I think women are going to be mothers and they're going to be executives. And so uh, someone asked me once, um, how did I think we could manage it? And I said, well, uh, it's no different than uh, say Orthodox Jews, of which we have some in our firm, that can't work Saturdays. Can you work out them not uh, working after sundown on Friday and uh, sunset on uh, Saturday, however it goes? And I said, I don't, I don't know, but I'll bet you they solve that problem in Israel. But they don't have that problem. And I also suggested that I bet if a woman was running a company, and it was a women-only company, I bet they'd figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's a matter of, um, in some of these issues of, the question is, well, what's really fair? And remember that in this fairness that you really are searching for talent, mm -hmm. right? Uh, people see that most clearly in athletics, that what is really important is, can you hit a baseball? Can you throw a basketball up? Can you do it? Now, if you have other things that are getting in the way of that, usually they don't prevail. Mm -hmm. So, so part of the leader's role is to create an environment where persons from various backgrounds can succeed, and that's clearly the best interest of the Oh, firm. I think so. Okay. You've had the unique experience of both uh, participating in a very large uh, uh, consulting organization with your career at, at IBM and now with uh, Blackwell Consulting Services, a, a, a smaller but industry-leading uh, information technology and management consulting firm. Can you describe some of the differences you've observed as it relates to uh, what's expected of leaders in those different environments? Um, you'd be surprised. I don't think much. Um, I think that um, uh, running, I was a branch manager at IBM and I had about 250 people working for me and uh, I've had 250, 300 working for me as a small business person. And there, there are two differences uh, that I've found. One is at IBM I was handling very large, very complex problems all the time. Uh, it was always uh, you know, $10 million, $30 million, $40 million. And sometimes when we were on outsourcing, they were really big numbers, three, four hundred million dollars. And I came to Blackwell, a small firm, you miss 
that complexity and the, the intellectual challenges that are there. But in a small firm, the intellectual challenges are different. They are, uh, how am I going to convince somebody that I'm better than a big brand name guy? So you spend all your time thinking about brand management, if you will. How do I convince people that I can do what they intuitively think is true about the IBM where I was? Mm -hmm. So you spend your time doing very different things. At IBM, all I worried about was the problem at hand and how we could figure it out. With every confidence that if I could demonstrate uh, the the feasibility viability of my proposed solution, they would buy it because they buy, bought us. At Blackwell, I can be uh, better than Accenture and IBM ten out of ten times, and I will lose eight of them. Okay, so if you're going to lose. 80% of the deals where you are know that you have the right answer, that tells you that you've got to focus on really being good. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to really get in tune. You can't whine and complain because that's just like the way life is. You know, I, 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 I can't imagine it's different here. Uh, you're up against Harvard, there's a lot of that stuff. There are a lot of people you're never going to convince that, that Pepperdine is a better business school than Harvard. So, but you can't let that get in your way. You got to tell them every day what makes Pepperdine special and unique, and then you'll have a successful program. So it sounds like leaders across uh, Blackwell Consulting Services are spending more time on brand management, you know, carving a, a unique value proposition when you're up against these larger consulting. Yeah, it's, it, because it, what happens is. It's not really different. The question is, what is your problem to be successful? Now, IBM thought its problem was getting the customer agreed, but we own the hardware business, we own the software business, but then they discovered that wasn't. Mm -hmm. When Microsoft came along, they had a different set of problems. They had to regrip, they had to change who they were and what they were doing and make a lot of changes. No, so I'm saying is that what an executive does is he has to figure out what the story is with his firm. Mm -hmm. He has to figure out how to drive business, how to motivate the people, how to keep the people, how to treat them fairly, mm -hmm. and how to do all those things. But it's essentially the same task. But uh, the, the problem is complexity. Mm -hmm. For example, in a consulting firm you only have two things to worry about, really rate and utilization, you know. So how much money am I getting for these people and how utilized are they and what do I pay them? But if you look at IBM, they manufacture stuff, they do research, they do, mm -hmm. it's a very complex business. And so you have to keep all that in mind. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an excellent segue in talking about what motivates the workforce, uh, what you have to do to retain talented people. Uh, there's lots of talk about the nature of, of the, the workforce and followership and the leadership language that has changed. Have you noted throughout your career that what employees expect of their leaders has changed uh, dramatically, significantly? Uh, if you think about your experiences at IBM compared to perhaps some of the more recent um, hiring decisions and retention issues that you've addressed, has, has that changed? Yeah, when I, when I remember what I just said. I, were, I had two jobs in my life. I worked at IBM. It, if IBM had never gotten in trouble, I would have never owned a business. Uh, I was going to go and retire from IBM and been happy. It was the everything I know how to do. I learned at IBM. I was the first kid to go to college. Uh, IBM told me when I hired them, go buy a blue suit, gray suit, wear white shirts. They told me everything, and. Um, I've never, I told the minus, I never asked for a raise when I was at IBM. In 25 years, I never asked for a raise. Now, my children would think that I was nuts. They all asked for raises. They fat, they walked in my <laughs> and plot how they're going to go ask for a raise. And I don't think they have the same. Uh, sense of what a company means to them. 
Um, I once told somebody once that IBM really captured my wife. My son was one years old, and and IBM sent him a silver spoon for his birthday. And everybody would say to my wife, "Well, you like a boy they really ripped you off." And she said, "No, you guys didn't send me one. Mm -hmm. They're the only one that sent me one." And so we thought very differently. Now at Blackwell. Uh, because we've also gone through hard times, lots of people have gone through hard times, and we've laid off employees and we have reduced pay, we've done a lot of things. And so the idea that people have about economics to me is, look, um, I'm working for you because you do certain things for me. If you don't do those things, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. I don't think it, it occurs to most of the people who work for Blackwell are going to be there 30 years from now. Or the, that if they are there, they're there because they think they personally have a good deal. They think about it. Mm -hmm. And they will, especially the A performers, which are the only ones you really care about fundamentally. Mm -hmm. The really talented guys will come in your office and say, hey, how am I doing? Uh, I want to talk to you about my income, what I think my contribution is, mm -hmm. and to see if you agree with me. Mm -hmm. And agreement means some things are going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so they don't have a lot of sympathy about uh, business problems that mm -hmm. we have. So I think it's very different. Yeah, so it sounds like leaders have uh, increased emphasis on the performance management responsibility, rewards, pay, but also the kinds of, of roles that they're performing for the, the, the A players or the, the talented employees, increased pressure on leaders to make sure, sure they're in very challenging assignments. Well, yeah, I've always thought uh, that, I, used to, I, I tell people this, there are three kinds of people. A's, C's, and F's. The F's you ought to get rid of right now, today. The A's you ought to throw a lot of money at them, you ought to tell them they're wonderful every day of the week and leave them alone. And the C's you ought to manage. And if you end up with all A and B performers, you've, been a, you've done a great job. But in most things, there's a certain category of people that are special in your business. And they don't need your help. In fact, a lot of them are better than you ever going to think about being. So you need to treat them really well. And the reason to tell managers that, because young managers always want to associate with the talented people, like it's going to rub off. Mm -hmm. And you have to say, you need to let talented people alone. They don't want your help, don't need your help. They just want you to tell them they're great and then leave them alone. Mm -hmm. And that's my experience. And so now people go through the, uh, the B to A so because they have, we all have weaknesses. That doesn't mean A performers don't have certain characteristics. A lot of technical people, for example, can't write a lick. And you have to be able to put your thoughts in writing persuasively if you're going to be in a consulting business. So they may be an A technically, but not be an mm -hmm. A some other things. Uh, so you need to help them where you can. But uh, you, any corporation, big, small, or otherwise, if they end up in A's and B's, and that's it, you got a great company. Well, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, what advice would you have for MBA students or other early career professionals who want to pursue a career in the information technology or management consulting field? I, I would encourage it because I think that IT is a, uh, is, uh, is, is a real productivity tool and I believe in it. What I, but they have to understand a big part of our business is very commoditized now. And so it's not near as important as that you understand the technical aspects of it in the sense that you actually can perform it, though I think it's important to know how. You have to focus on the business value that you're bringing, because that's the only way that you can compete now 
because there are all kinds of people. Well, when the Indians are done with their 40 and $50 an hour, there's about a billion Chinese that are going to come on stream and they're going to learn English and they're going to do whatever they need to do to compete for this business. So I don't see that that stuff is ever not going to be fiercely competitive. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that we got to bring to it is the, the high level intellectual work that, uh, that we've demonstrated over the years, knowing how to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for coming today. We have uh, a pleasure having you on campus.